first you have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good afternoon. I have with me in the studio today Dr Stephen Phillips, author of the new book Silver Lining, which is an investigation into UFOs. Now, Dr Phillips, can you tell us a little about your book? Yes, certainly. Over the last 12 years, I've become increasingly interested in the subject of UFOs, and this book is a compilation of all the sightings that I've heard about, together with evidence. You see, so many people are convinced that there is life on other planets that I thought I would do some research myself. And what did you find? Are we alone in the universe? <laughs> you sound sceptical. Well, you'll have to buy the book to find out my personal conclusion, but I can tell you this. There are a lot of sightings in a number of different countries, and the surprising fact that I have found is that despite never having met each other, a great number of these witnesses describe an almost identical object. Now, I realise that television and the media has given us all a mental picture of a UFO, a silver ship with bright lights that moves at very high speed. What interested me was that in all the eyewitness accounts I heard, people gave very precise and detailed descriptions that varied only slightly. Reports from America, Europe, even Asia, all share a significant number of similarities. Hmm, interesting. Tell me, have you been able to see any evidence yourself? Well, no. My aim in writing this book was not really to present my own opinion, but to gather all the information available and collate it into a kind of reference guide. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. The second chapter of my book actually talks about a place in America that has often been in the media, Area 51. Area 51? Yes, it's a military base in New Mexico. In 1947, a man called McBrazel claimed... Sorry, who? McBrazel. That's M-A-C, capital B-R-A-Z-E-L. Anyway, McBrazel claimed to have found pieces of an alien spacecraft on his farm in Roswell. Now, many people believe that this was true and that the government of the time took the debris. Since that time... They have denied all knowledge of any such find, and accounts by the many leading experts at the time dismissed the claim, believing that McBrazel had actually found pieces of a higher altitude weather balloon that had disintegrated. Now, the lack of information combined with a large number of conspiracy theorists means that no useful scientific conclusion can be drawn, but I have found out one or two surprising details. Again, you'll have to buy the book if you want to find out more. OK. Now, I understand that an overwhelming majority of UFO sightings occurred in America. Do you find that in any way relevant? Well, as I mentioned before, there are a large number of conspiracy theorists, and the popularity of science fiction programs in America could lead you to suspect that these sightings may be nothing more than an overactive imagination. However, I have found that there are a number of other factors that determine UFO sightings. In Northern Europe, the number of reports is very low, whereas in Southern Europe, where there is more open space, less light pollution, and generally clearer skies, the number of sightings increases. Now, when you consider the vast open areas of America, particularly around New Mexico, there is an argument that UFOs are simply easier to see in certain geographical and climatic situations. Hmm. Well, I've never thought of that. 
If I could ask you one final question, Dr. Phillips, what about alien abduction? Ah, uh, well, I don't really cover that in my book. You see, I was looking to present facts from which people could draw their own conclusions. With these reported abductions, I've found them to be very unreliable. Well, thank you very much for your time. Before we finish, I'd just like to add that Silver Lining is available at all leading bookstores, priced at £19.99. Until next week, goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a telephone conversation about a job vacancy. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, Top Job Employment Agency. Ellen Sykes speaking. How can I help you? Good morning. My name's Steve Collins and I'm calling about the call centre job advertised in today's paper. For an operative handling credit card inquiries? Yes, that's right. The wages and working conditions are all in the ad, so what I'd like to know now is what the work actually consists of. I should explain that I'm a student looking for a summer job, not long-term employment. That's OK. The people at Intercard say they've always found students to be honest, which of course is essential in this line of work, and they have the basic IT skills needed there. Apparently, there have been a few who didn't find it easy to get there on time in the morning, but in most cases, their punctuality is as good as anybody else's. Anyway, about the work. And I know a bit about this because, as it happens, I've worked there myself. Really? Yes, for about a year. You'd find that most callers would be people wanting to check the balance on their cards, query payments made and so on. And from those who've had their cards stolen? No, they ring another number for that, an emergency line. People also call that number if they lose their cards. And what are most callers like? I mean, what kind of people are they? All sorts, really. All ages, every kind of background. Though one definite trend is the change in the number of women. Nowadays, they make up around 55% of the total, whereas years ago, there used to be a majority of men calling. At one time, I heard, as many as three quarters of all credit cards were actually held by men, but that must have been long before I was there. It's certainly different now. So to do this job, what sort of experience do I need? None, really. Have you got a credit card yourself? Yes, I have. Then you probably know quite a bit about them already. And as a student, you're obviously intelligent, which of course you need to be for the job. So after a day or so working with an experienced operative, I'm sure you'll have picked up enough to deal with routine inquiries, which of course most of them are. But there are bound to be questions I can't deal with, at least at first, what happens then? In that case, you can ask a supervisor. They're very helpful to new staff. I think I like the sound of this. What do I do next? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Can you get over there for 9.45 on Monday morning for an interview? Definitely, yes. Whereabouts are they? In Riverside Business Park. Do you know it? Yes, I've been there once. How do you usually travel? By bus. Right. So you take either the 136 or 137 to the bus station, and when you come out of there, you turn right. Along Orchard Road, that is. The road from the railway station? Yes, that's right. You go past the petrol station next to the car dealers, then carry on down the road. Do I take the first left at the main car park? Well, you could do that and walk up Newfield Avenue alongside the shopping centre, but it's a long way round. I'd suggest continuing along Orchard Road with the water company and then the insurance offices on your right. They used to be local government offices, by the way. Yes, I remember those. And you keep going until you reach the advertising agency. Now, facing that is a small road called Cherry Lane. There's a newspaper office on the corner, and opposite that is a big hotel, so you can't miss it. And how far down that road is it? Well, they aren't actually in Cherry Lane. You walk as far as the next junction and turn right into Armand Drive at the mail centre. Intercard is in the third building on the right between the airline offices and the shipping company. Fine. I'll be there on Monday. Thanks very much. Bye. Good luck. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a radio programme about buying a house. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon, listeners. Today, I'd like to welcome Edward Fox, who is going to talk to us today about buying a house. Edward. Thank you, Eunice. For most people, at least, buying a house is a major life event and probably the single most expensive item you are ever likely to buy. It is also a place that you can make your home. Therefore, thinking carefully before you make a purchase is of the utmost importance. One of the most important things to consider before buying any property is the location. Because remember, it is where you plan to spend a large part of your life, or indeed the rest of your life in some circumstances. Therefore, consider the type of life you enjoy leading. Are you a very sociable person? who enjoys nightclubs and discos? If so, then you may wish to consider something close to the city, or indeed in a city where it is convenient for all types of nightlife. On the other hand, if, like me, you prefer a quieter life, then you may want to consider something away from the city. However, do remember that proximity to your place of work is also important. Indeed, we spend most of our life at work, and you don't want to have to spend two or more hours every day travelling to work now, do you? Therefore, transport is the utmost importance. City suburbs, however, are often conveniently located for commuting to work. All for shopping. Without being in the heart of a busy city. You may, however, 
think that a house in the suburbs would be far too expensive. Yet houses located in cities can often exceed the price of suburban houses. So check out the prices. You may be surprised. Family is another important consideration. You may prefer a house that is away from a busy street or main road. And of course, remember that children have to attend school. Is there a good school in the area, or would your children have to travel a long distance to get to school? Therefore, if you have children or you plan to have children, location is a very important factor. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty six to thirty. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. There are, of course, various types of houses. There are detached houses which stand alone and are not joined by to another building. Then there are semi-detached houses, which incidentally are the most common, and for good reason. Because they are less expensive than detached houses, this is because they are, in fact, two houses joined together and therefore take up less space. And finally, there are town houses, which are many houses joined together to form a long row. But don't think that town houses are less expensive than semi-detached houses. They rarely are. This is because they are usually built in cities where the prices of property is very expensive indeed. The age of property is another consideration. If you're considering buying an old house, beware. You may be faced with expensive repairs and renovation bills. So have the house thoroughly checked by a professional surveyor before you decide to buy. But then again, there are things you can look for yourself. Things such as the condition of the woodwork, especially doors and windows, that can be expensive to replace. More importantly, make sure all the fixtures and fittings. Things such as cupboards, sinks, taps, bathtubs are all in good working order, because replacing kitchens and bathrooms can be a very costly business. And don't forget the garden. If the property has one, if you enjoy gardening, then fine. But if you don't enjoy gardening, then you may prefer a small garden as opposed to a big one. But even if you do enjoy gardening, it is important to remember that gardens take up a lot of your time. So keeping a garden in good order. May be very difficult if you work long hours. One final thing is the general feel of the place. Does it have a good atmosphere? And most importantly of all, would you feel comfortable living there? Thank you, Edward. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But I'll be back next Wednesday when my guest speaker will be talking about buying a computer. So until then, bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a wildlife expert giving a talk to a group of bird lovers in the UK about a species called the tawny owl. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening, everyone. You're all likely to be familiar with pictures of the tawny owl because of all the owl species in the UK, it's actually the most common one. But the chances are that you're more likely to have heard one than actually seen one, as it's also strongly nocturnal. This means that it normally ventures out at night. So what kind of habitat does the tawny owl prefer? Well, a survey carried out in the 1980s confirmed that this owl is most likely to be found in woodland. If you look at a map of tawny owl distribution across Britain, you'll only see gaps in the treeless marshy areas of eastern England and in some of the more upland parts of northwest Scotland. However, you can sometimes find populations of tawny owls in urban areas too, either in parks or in large gardens. The tawny owl shows some obvious adaptations to its natural habitat. For example, both its wings and its tail are short, which helps it to manoeuvre through the trees. Also, the bird's plumage is a mixture of brown and grey, and this provides suitable camouflage for when the owl perches up against a tree trunk. Then there are its large eyes, the tawny owl's visual capacities are considerably better than those of humans, and although it can't see in complete darkness, it's sufficiently well equipped to be able to navigate its way around woodland on all but the most overcast nights. Another factor that contributes to the tawny owl's success as a hunter is its excellent memory of the layout of different areas. If you combine this ability with the owl's strongly territorial and sedentary nature, most populations of tawny owl are sit-and-wait predators, you realise that it has a good opportunity to predict where prey might be found. Finally, as well as having large eyes, the owl's sense of hearing is excellent, and this helps it to locate potential prey as it sits on its perch. Turning now to the tawny owl's diet. Woodland tawny owls feed mainly on mammals, especially small ones, such as wood mice and bank voles. But they'll also take things like frogs or bats or even fish if they happen to be available. In urbanised landscapes, the owls seem to prey more on birds. So there are some differences there. Let's just look briefly now at survival rates in the tawny owl. Young tawny owls face a difficult time once they leave home, and two out of every three are likely to die within their first year. So, with such high mortality levels, it's a good job that established breeding pairs can produce young over a number of seasons and maximise their chances of passing their genes on to the next generation of owls. I've already mentioned the sedentary nature of the tawny owl, but it's not just adult tawny owls that are sedentary in their habits. Young birds, dispersing away from where they were born, rarely move far. The average distance is just four kilometres. There also appears to be some reluctance to cross large bodies of water. The owl is absent from many of the islands around our shores, with only occasional sightings in Ireland and the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. Right, well, now I'll show you some photographs that have been taken in one or two of the... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.